The whole music chose me, I think, more so than I choosing it. I think our family were always steeped in it. My parents were set dancers. They just like going out dancing at the weekend. So, you know, it was always there and I just wanted to play myself. And I was self-taught as well because I was too self-conscious, I think, to, to go and get a teacher. But then, you know, as life progressed in, in, in the States, I met a guy from, from Castle Barron, County Mayo, called Johnny Hoban. He said to me one day, I was like, you know, why don't you write your own songs? And I was like, what? I don't know anything about that. And he said, well, he was saying, well, why don't you just write about, you know, what you know, your locality or neighbor, something, even if it's not through whatever it is, just something that's, that you're familiar with, rather than doing some pie in the sky thing that you don't know anything about. Of course, the most famous song that I kind of know is Work on the Streets, which I had no experience of at all. To. <laughs> it's only based on a story a guy told me in a pub. But, uh, uh, you know, so I, I didn't follow his advice exactly. But most of my other songs after that are kind of based on that. Like, you know, and I think that's why I was, I met such a connection the other night and at, at Lady Gregory because people were out to identify, even though they had never heard any of the songs before. I were able to identify with the themes that I was talking about, the places I mentioned, you know, the the situations that were involved as well. Even when I was talking about the Virginian when they came on television, like pretty much everyone in the hall I could tell knew exactly what I was talking about there. Because it was a new thing. You know, we're watching cowboy movies on the television at long last. Great. You know, you had to go to the cinema before that to see them. You know, I think once I started doing that, you know, I, I kind of found my groove, I knew where, where I should be going, you know. Okay, so I'm, I'm Vincent Keenan's sister, a little bit younger, <laughs> not a lot. Um, I live in County Clare, I grew up one of six siblings, and uh, my role in the album, I suppose, I've always been interested in music and song, and particularly interested in um, you know, the compositions of Vincy in particular, I think, um, because there's a great resonance. So Flahulach means generosity. It's really, it's kind of a, it's almost like a bigger form of generosity, the word that we know as generosity. And it's a giving, it's a, you know, it's a way of sharing and giving. And uh, yeah, there's a great Flahulachus, is what I would say, in the whole, um, project that was Great Highway because Vincy has for many years, you know, worked on songwriting and he has, and all of his songs, I think, come from here. They come from the heart and they are, they're not trying to be anything in particular, you know, they're just very much about his experiences, both with his family and his children and his travels and, uh, and heroes. And there's a great, there's a huge generosity in that. He's not, you know, he's not trying to get out there for what's popular or what, you know, just... And he is the most flahula person you and I have ever met. Joe Keehan, I'm a year older than him. When I was about four years old, I got rheumatic fever when I was going to my, like, first year of school. I was so ill that I, I had to stay at home. And by the time that I had recovered from it, my mother decided, ah, you know, screwed now, let's wait till next year. And the two of you start together. So actually, Joe and myself then were in school together, like since in infants. So, you know, we're joined as they hit me and him. And I, there's not a week goes by that I don't talk to him like five times. And it's been like that all through our lives. Yeah. So we're very, very close, the two of us. I never lifted a finger in the farm. I was just not cut out for the farm in life at all. I think a lot of people mightn't realise that the farmers actually love their animals so much. They're like almost like their kids a bit, like, you know. They love their cows and their cattle and sheep and they're out stay out all night on their cabin and everything. It's not just business to them at all. These, especially these small rural farms, maybe for the big, you know, industrial one, which they're not really in Ireland anyway. Maybe I'm too long in California, but you will not hear the average farmer 
expressing love in any way outside of what you see. They're not going to talk about it. Just they can't do it. And we're all guilty of that, like. Certificate of Outstanding Musical Achievement. This prestigious award has never before been bestowed upon any man, woman or child. So I took a good few lessons in the banjo. And for a while I thought I was getting quite good at it. And I used to be listening to Dizzy Mulcair and some of the great banjo players and I actually thought I was nearly as good as them. <laughs> One fateful day, a great friend of mine, he was until that moment, called Pat O'Donnell. I think he's here. I told him not to let him in, but he might be here. Pat came to the house along with my other former good friend, Paddy Egan. And they asked me would I play a tune in the banjo. And we got out about me banjo and I tuned it up. And I played me a few tunes. And on a Saturday night, Pat O'Donnell rang me and he said, are you coming into Hindus tonight, Josie? So I went in and Pat O'Donnell stood up in a stool. I have an announcement to make, he said. I have an award to give to Joseph Keehan. I shoved out my chest, I said, my God, this must be good. And all I could think of in my moment of madness was the Oscars. Do you ever watch the Oscars? <laughs> and Paddy Egan took out this massive big thing. He said, the award, he said, is, I'm going to present this to Joseph Keehan, a, a very accomplished award, for being the worst banjo player <laughs> in the world. His younger brother, we went to school together, we were brought up together. And in fairness to him, it must have been fairly difficult, you know, to compose some songs and put some music behind them and have the time to do it while it's working and run his company. It couldn't have been very easy, but he has done it. And um, I mean, it was probably his lifelong ambition to compose some songs and make an album. I think this is kind of the pinnacle of it, really. I think the family here are very proud of it. I think it means a lot to it means a lot to me and my siblings are delighted over it and I'm sure if my parents are delighted. I'd be very proud. So this is our family. So I'm here on the right, then Vincy, then Joe, and then Bridget, my sister and Mum and Dad, outside our home in County Colin. The photo on top is of my late daughter and Vincy. One of the songs on the album he um dedicated to the memory of Emer and it's called The Lovely Woodlands of Clare. Where are you now? My friend, the old ash tree I told you all my secret What I'd grow up to be I'll wander down to where The daisies and the primrose grow That's the place I used to go And you'd find me there In the lovely woodland Mary Noonan is a force of nature, like Mary's brilliant. She's, um, she's the, Mary does as much work as like 20 people. She was also the principal of a school in Kilinina for many years and she's retired now. She knows everyone, she knows the people that work in the radio stations, the people in the newspapers. She's been involved in the school over the years, she got to know a lot of people. So she's very well connected. Plus she's a great singer, so she goes around to all the singing clubs all over the country singing as well. Well, up in, until she lost her daughter Emer there five years ago, that was like a devastating blow for her. Because Emer was, Emer and herself actually were like another mother and daughter, but they were almost more like sisters. So they had that kind of a relationship and it was really very, very hard on Mary to, to lose her that time, you know, when she, 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 she died in a... She was out jogging in a place called NNA in France where she was teaching and she somehow or another tumbled down a ravine and, and hit her head and she died. So the backstory of that? Yeah, well, I don't know what to talk about now. Well, um, I'm passing that one. You don't want to go there. No. It was so unfortunate because she was a beautiful girl, really talented musician, great singer, just 
kind of perfect, uh, like a little angel actually. She was a lovely person. So we were all devastated, but no, no more so than her mother, of course, and father. Five years ago, I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago, but yeah. She's like, when she has a problem, she'd say, like, Emer, tell me what to do now here. You know, how should I do this? And she's convinced that she's getting guidance, you know. And, you know, it's, it's great that she's still, you know, some, you never get over something like that. So I think it's good that she has that connection all the time, like, you know, you know whether it's just a spiritual connection or what it is. It's, a, it's good for her. The Wishing Tree. I thought of her as the wishing tree that died and saw it lifted root and branch to heaven, trailing a shower of all that had been driven, need by need by need, into its hail, sapwood and bark. Coin and pin and nail came streaming from it like a comet tail, new minted and dissolved. I had a vision of an airy branch head rising through damp cloud of turned up faces where the tree had stood. There's no falling o'er the midlands now, and the wind it whips through the trees. Far across the town of Mundar, famine gives no ease. From the villages, the monster they have died and gone away. There's a boat leaving cold next week, and on it I will be. Three weeks we spent on board that boat, sailing in a ship of hell. How many people died on no one there can tell. We are bound for Argentina, boys, back far off distant land, where they say that the pampas grasses there grow tall at your command. Okay, so the song is called Argentina. So the first line says, Era Verta, Men of the Famine. I see get emotional when I say that. Eregorta, ta ar malche We have, we've had our lands, our homes, and villages are deserted. It's funny, like, you know, obviously we're so far removed from it, but yet we have a huge. Immediately you have a, an emotional response. It seems it's there in our DNA somewhere. But from that horrible experience and from that tragedy, you know, grew a wonderful whole new a new thing was born really I think from the immigration and the, the, the amazing diaspora that's all over the world something that grew from tragedy really yeah. I mean I was a teacher myself and so I always taught the children lots of songs in Gaelic so that they would have that you know they're not speaking Gaelic at home anymore but they they will carry the songs to their children I hope that's my and it was similarly with the people who emigrated in the diaspora who left, you know, so long ago. I would always have thought like that if my singing or, or my, my songs or whatever it might be, or, or, you know, if it brought a little bit of happiness to somebody, there's nothing better than you can do than that. You know, if you bring some hap a bit of happiness to somebody's life, which I think we succeeded in doing the other night at the Lady Gregory. I, d I don't think that you can ask for any more as a musician than if you can succeed in doing that when somebody comes out to hear you play, that they, were, that they go home with a smile on their face. If you, if you do that, you've done your job, I think. Yeah, I think any artist actually succeeds in doing that. They've done, done, a, done a good thing.